Welcome and thanks for joining us today for the second of our author webinar series, Changing Perspectives. Uh, today, I'm very excited to be facilitating this conversation with one of Pearson's market leading authors on weaving equity, diversity and inclusion into research methods for business students. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Daniel Reed, and I'm an academic consultant with Pearson UK. Joining us today is Mark Sanders, Mark Saunders, sorry, Professor of Research Methods from the University of Birmingham and author on our market leading title, Research Methods for Business Students, which has over half a million copies sold and is the most highly cited text in business and economics in the world, according to the Financial Times. Uh, we're very excited uh, Mark could join us today. Just a quick thanks to my colleagues on the call who are in the background ensuring this webinar runs smoothly. I'll pass over to Mark shortly, but before we get started, we just want to run through some quick housekeeping. We know many of you are working from home, and as you know, these from these kind of conversations, uh, we sometimes get some background noise. So if you could please make sure you're on mute to ensure everyone gets the opportunity to hear from our presenters. We have a packed agenda and a lot to get through over the next hour. But uh, firstly, we'd like to thank those who have pre-submitted questions. We've tried to incorporate these questions into the agenda to make sure they're covered. However, as always, we'd like this to be an interactive and engaging session as much as possible. So please feel free to ask any questions you may have in the chat or come off mute and we'll get to as, as many of them as we can throughout the session as well as at the end. Okay, that's all from me now. I'll pass things over to Mark and bear with me while I get the screen share set up and then we'll get started. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Dan, and for setting this up, and also to Pearson. Um, I started preparing this, like, oh, I was preparing, I thought, in 1996, I signed a contract to write a book, which um, then Pitt Pittman said we might be lucky and sell 3,000 copies in the first five years. I think, folks, um, it's nice to prove people wrong. And that would never have happened without you guys, your students and people actually recommending and using it. So I'm going to start this with a major thanks to all you folks for, the, for using the book and hopefully it will continue to be of use uh, in in terms of the microphones, folks, if you could mute your microphones, that's going to make life a lot better unless you want to speak, because otherwise we're going to get quite a lot of interruptions. Um, the other people I do want to thank, uh, and it's on the slides, uh, Kay Richardson, who's been our um, amazing online content editor, and we're going to be seeing some of the fantastic things Kay's done in terms of weaving diversity, equity and inclusion into the book in terms of the online materials and also Vicky Tubb who has looked after me from, from most of the editions of the book and is an absolutely phenomenal um, um, commissioning editor and couldn't have done it without both you guys so thank you very much. Um, if you can pop, pop, pop on to the next slide please Daniel. I was talking to a very close friend this morning about giving this presentation I was saying I'm feeling a fraud I'm doing a presentation on them um, equality or equity, diversity and inclusion as a white male who's basically had mega privilege all his life. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I really shouldn't even be standing here. But so hopefully, folks, you'll take it as somebody who's desperately trying to talk about something which he's never actually really experienced to any extent. And yet I see it in so many of my friends and and they do experience on a day to day basis. So apologies if I don't get the terminology right sometimes and I make mistakes please do pick me up and if you have any questions as we go through please do ask me what I want to be talking about is how we've tried to weave in these ideas of equality diversity and inclusion into the book so it just becomes a natural part of what we do when we're teaching research methods rather than actually forcing it to be part of it and Within that, I want to talk first of all about how we've tried to write the book um, as partners in a learning process rather than talking down. So we're working with our students in doing research and our colleagues and in terms of the language and in terms of the language we use and also how we've used various features in the book, such as vignettes, case studies, box examples to actually emphasise issues and then talk about 
sort of extra help there is is in terms of appendices and making it more accessible, especially for people who are visually impaired in terms of the paper based book. Um, I've been working very closely with um, Kay Richardson, who's on the call, thank goodness. So if there's any difficult questions, Kay can answer all those um, about converting it into digital form and in both as a need text and also into Revel. And Kay's been incredibly supportive and helpful in taking my ideas and running with them and developing them in amazingly accessible ways, which I could never even have thought of. So we will look a bit about the digital side of it. And then I wanted to finish up with um one aspect which was it's all very well to talk about this but how do you actually teach it so i i thought i'd talk about how um i've been teaching um decolonization and relating that to philosophical assumptions so it just becomes part of philosophical assumptions in research methods what i would say is i think it's crucial that as academics and the tech teachers stroke instructors to our students it's crucial that we weave these ideas into what we do and they become a natural part of what we do and i think it's really it crucial that we actually challenge our students to think differently on these issues and not to accept the status quo part of what we need to be doing in my view is to educate in the future the future academics the future business leaders the future workers to represent and to understand what could be a better and fairer society for us all um, just to reiterate, I will take questions at any time, but we'll, let's get moving and have a look at aspects we've tried to put into the book and how we teach it. So next slide, please, Dan. OK, this idea of being a partner in the learning process, we. And I have spent a lot of time working on this on the, this edition, and I've, I've incorporated my son and my daughter to read it and ask, tell me when I get it wrong. So. I'm not putting the blame onto them, but it's been read by, shall we say, younger people who might have a better idea of what language makes sense nowadays to make sure we're writing as it should be. But we've tried to engage the student as a partner in the learning process. So we have here a quote about how we're trying to do that. So that first sentence, which comes out of the very early on, we would look at talking about what is research. We sort of ha we've had a bit of discussion in the text and we say based upon this brief, brief discussion, we can already see. So we're trying to say you're part of what we're doing. So we're doing this together. And then we talk about the purpose of research. And again, we can therefore define it. So we pull it, pull the students into this. But then obviously, as um, lecturers, we're also trying to enable students to do their own research. So in the last part of this quote, we're actually saying to as part of this, your research. So we say, OK, this is what we've, we've seen together. But when you take it and move it forward as part of your research. We, we, you'll be doing this. So what we've tried to do is to not write in an unacademic way. So there's still references in there, but try and write it in a way which is accessible, particularly to people who may not have English as their first language. So we're still using the correct terms, but we're not actually putting lots of long words in and we're trying to integrate them by talking about we and they. So we very rarely, unless we're talking about a particular person, are using gender specific language. So let's have a look at how this might work out a bit more in the way the book's structured. Next slide, please, Daniel. Um, on each chapter of the book, we start off with something to try and grab the student's attention. I've found these are quite useful to start a lecture off uh, on particular topic. So this is the opening vignette for the chapter on research philosophy. And we're going to come back to this when we talk about how do we teach um, philosophy and decolonization within methods. But what I've tried to do here is to bring out the idea of their alternative beliefs and alternative ideas. And so in this opening vignette, we grab the student's attention by saying how are in beliefs and assumptions about how the world operates affects both the data we gather and how we interpret that data. So saying what we believe affects what we're going to do. And then we move straight into the idea of colonisation and how the colonisers have dominant views. And then into an example of modern Australia founded on Western colonial systems. Um, El Elmira, can you? Oh, thank you very much. Was a star you've muted without being asked. Really grateful. Thank you. Um, we look, move to Australia, which is founded on Western colonial systems and yet didn't include the First Nations knowledge, cultures and rights and practices. And in fact, they weren't even counted in the population until the mid 1960s. 
So there's some very different things coming through through there, which start to get us thinking about alternative forms of knowledge and how what we believe affects the data we collect. So that's one example we're using in the opening vignette. If we can have the next slide, please. Another one is one example we use is in the chapter on using secondary data. And here what we're trying to get over to the students is the fact that there's so much data out there which is already collected by others which we may be able to use for our own research. So we, we, we're talking here about digital data trails and how each time you attend a lecture, take money out of the ATM, etc., it bring you you you're increasing your digital data trail where you've been. We link it into visiting the library and things like that. But to illustrate this, I I was working out in Australia, was down in Sydney, and it was the time of Sydney Mardi Gras, and my partner was taking money out of this amazing ATM, which because it was at, it was um Pride Week became a gay ATM. I just what a fantastic illustration of a of a di of a digital realities we have nowadays and how that's been recorded but it just sort of says it brings into the fact that when you're going you're being tracked in the vicinity of events that are happening so it just sort of brings this to life in a hopefully relatively subtle way we can have the next slide please the other thing we uh, another thing we've done in the book is we tend we put at the end of each chapter we put um uh, a, a case study and, and we have new case studies in each edition to try and keep them up to date and also relevant. So I'll be talking this afternoon using examples from a couple of case studies from the current edition, but I know in the audience we have um, colleagues who've actually written case studies in earlier editions and they will well know because they gave permission that there are, I think it's about 80, 90 other case studies that can be used linked across the book. But in terms of looking at um, diversity and inclusion, we're trying to actually, you include case studies which are relevant to our students. Now, we tend to teach a large number of students whose first language is not English, who uh, have come from overseas. And so I asked one of my friends to write, Free Badrabi, to write a case study looking at internationalization, and internationalization, which is one of her research specialities, and link it into the sorts of work that her students were doing in especially her international students. And so here we have a case study on internationalizing strategy, but the actual case inside this is about research design. So it relates to, for, to chapter five, but the opening part actually links it to a real, actually it's a real dissertation, which has been anonymized and adapted to bring out learning aspects more clearly. But we have an overseas student who's undertaking his undergraduate studies. He's doing an international consultancy group project so it's fitting with the sorts of stuff we're starting to do now and we've got the aim of the project and then it goes on to talk about the what what sort of strategy they're going to use in their design but you can see how it's starting to to bring in a, a global group of students moving on please daniel another good friend of mine mina baigi who works in um at southampton university i asked her to write a, a case which on um based on some of her research on female rideshare app drivers in Tehran. And this was to actually try and, first of all, it's illustrating issues of access and sample selection in the case. But what it was also trying to do was to show things work differently in different parts of the world, but we can still do research. Obviously, the what's happened in Iran subsequently has rather taken over. But we have a case here written by somebody working in the UK, but originally from Tehran. We have academics working with us from the USA and Iran. So we're trying to bring in world views in this and just make them normal as part of the research. And this one links to a really great research paper in a top academic journal as well. So we're trying to bring the whole different ideas together, almost by um, osmosis, the students can actually feel these things. So that's sort of looking at case studies. Um, we also have a variety of different boxed examples in the book. If we can flip over, Daniel, please. Next slide. And in these boxed examples, what we're trying to do is three things. We have boxed examples which focus on management research. So where we look at examples of excellent method to illustrate how people have undertaken research and where we call those focus on management research. 
we have examples which we call focus on research in the news where we take at the time of writing topical issues and then actually look at what's being said from a research and to illustrate a research methods point and we'll look at one of those in a minute and then we have focus on student research where we use examples from student research over the years to actually illustrate points of how to do things well and also where things can go wrong as parts of learning and in setting these examples we again are trying to get this idea of diversity in there and inclusion so here we've got a couple of boxed examples from the first one box 9.1 is in the chapter on observation as a method and it's a lovely study in um, the journal Leisure Studies in uh, at the inauguration of a uh, Mardi Gras. And which it was an event which had been conceived to support in part to support LBTQI plus residents, but it has about 12,000 attendees. And we have a, the example, the method in it is so beautiful about how somebody is observing and then and there's issues of observation as participants so we can link it into all the theory as well but it just gives some fantastic insights of of doing this and there's also some interviews going on there as well so we see this idea of multi-method coming in the um, other example is one of my favorite papers of all time um and it's a lovely study by um griffin and people like mark learmouth month and what they have there in this organization studies paper is they've used secondary data and the secondary data they've used is disney films with princesses in and the animated films which is and this one i find it really just excites students that you can use that as data and they can actually be studying and watching the, watching films at the same time so that's that's the first point but what what they, um griffin and colleagues were doing in here was they were actually using these this data set and showing how in the early animations work was represented as a place which women should not be in. It was no place, especially not for strong women at all. And in the early films, um, women, so we say something like Snow White, was depicted as sort of, as not being part of an organisation, rejected as part on the part of being mother, homemaker, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they they looked at this in terms of women's organisational readiness for work and compared the early films with the contemporary ones where it was very different in that, although the storylines are similar, similar, the passivity of women in, in relation to work and favouring home is replaced by active, strong females and helping others to face up to their responsibilities. And it, they say it highlights that women's strength rather than weakness, and that's desirable and encapsulates the expectation that women should perform actively in the workplace. So there's some fantastic insights coming out, which we can bring out, we bring out in this little box. But also, they also highlight, which I think is a paradox of which I was thinking about with my own children, is when you've been, if you're a young viewer and you've been brought up seeing all the Disney films on Netflix or on DVD, you, you get presented with a paradox that girls must be both weak and strong and they must work and not work. So there's some very interesting things coming out of those. But it's just a lovely way to introduce students to the possibilities of alternate secondary data. I mean, there's another case in there which looks at um, focus on management research, looking at desert island discs as a, a case study for how managers were thinking. Let's have the next slide, please. This next slide is not so much an EDI one, if I'm really honest, but it is, I think it's such an important point. I wanted to make it anyway. So this is me I, leaping off as colleagues who, there who know me. I do tend to have digressions. So this is my digression slide. And I think it's a really crucial digression slide, given what's happened in the UK with Brexit over the last few years. And what this slide does is it talks about the way the question was worded really crucial it's in the chapter on questionnaire design not surprisingly but what we see is we start off with a question which is should britain remain or leave in the leave the eu which then after um the remain campaign has made um, a number of complaints got changed to should be should britain remain a member so the or leave was removed 
and the research shows that that is likely to have made a 4% difference in the answer. Now, when we re recognise that it was actually 51.9% who voted for leave, that 4% difference in the answer would have forced, changed it to a 52% a vote for Remain. So I think this is such a powerful way to introduce why question wording is so important. And it it makes people think and it's real and it I mean, I hope sorry, I'm getting a bit bouncy and I can see Amanda. I know you're on the call when I start talking too quickly to just come off, demute yourself and tell me to slow down, please. Amanda is one of my close friends and colleagues. and It's lovely to have you here, Amanda. So please do that. Um, but really, this is such an important thing. It brings methods to life for our students. So that was some focus, a focus on research in the news. Let's have a look at the next slide with focus on student research. What we do with these boxes is we try to provide short and pithy ish illustrations of what students might expect or where they might go wrong or where they may be doing things well. And in doing so, we've actually we try to make sure that our students of of different genders. We also try to make sure that they have different names and so on. So we are in terms of which are associated with different eth ethnicities. So in bo these boxes are both taken from the quantitative analysis chapter and in box 12.2 we can see Rashid is actually designed a questionnaire but we're actually talking here it's really about collecting ordinal and nominal data as it turns out to be as the box progresses. So this is how I mean about we've just built in this these ideas of diversity without actually playing on it and ram it down people's throats. It's just the reality of how research is done and who student bodies are. Conversely, in box 12.5, we have Lucy, who's look, is in looking at what people video on their smartphones. So, and then she's taking, she's analysing video clips um, quantitatively. And this one is really about how do you actually input data into an Excel spreadsheet to ensure you can analyse it, and anal analyze it. So it's looking at variables and cases and so on. OK, let's have a look at the next slide, please. Um, so that's sort of about structure, but we. We spend a lot of time thinking about advice on writing, and this is where things have really started to come together over the past few years, especially in terms of language. I can remember writing about this a few editions ago, and there the most useful piece of work I found was by a guy called Bill Bryson in his book Mother Tongue, and he was arguing very strongly that we really ought to look for gender neutral language because what we're trying to do as writers is to get people to read our work. And if we use language as offence because of gender, then that's one less person who will read our ideas and we're trying to get people to read ideas. But well, it's moved on a bit now. So this is the sort of things we're trying to say is we're saying we should try and avoid language that assumes gender or, the, or classification of people. This is something which is normal now, thank goodness. And then constant reference to managers as he. It's inaccurate, as we know, and it gives offence to many people. And that's quite right. And we're try saying to our students, those offended would probably include your readers. And yet it's simple enough to avoid if we think about it. And then we give an example. What we also do, though, which is important, is we have an appendix later, which gives more detailed guidance. But we're also in this chapter on writing, really emphasising to students that they do need to conform to a structure and that they also need to conform to rules and regulations, in particular the assessment criteria. So we've actually to get to that as a fun way of actually trying to get them to think about structures and why structures are important. We actually use the idea of um, a haiku, the Japanese poem. And so we talked talked about what the structure of a Japanese po haiku, haiku was. And then we actually wrote, actually wrote a haiku about um, drafting a project report and put that in to try and find a new way. And then the picture we used to illustrate um, this this opening vignette is actually one of the of a Japanese garden. It's actually in the Brisbane Botanical Gardens. But the crucial th thing here is we're actually trying to get students to think about why it's important. And if we can move on to the next slide, please. 
Yeah, what we've therefore done is we've actually put in some guidelines for non-discriminatory language and we've worked here very much with the British Sociological, Sociological so Association, the B British Psychological Society and various other organisations as to what they're suggesting. And it, we have to remember this is something that's fluid and is changing over time. So earlier editions, they're not quite the same because things have moved on. We also tried to make it relevant to today. And so in the opening discussion of it, we talk about um, the Black Lives Matters move, move that movement and then use that to link into why non-discriminatory language is even though difficult is crucial and why we should do it and so we talk about how it reiterates some um, beliefs and prejudices how non how discriminatory language is oppressive of obviously we also say it's unfair and incorrect as well but crucially we're trying to get over to students in addition to this it has a real negative impact on the work they do in terms of whether it's going to be read and acted upon them if we're doing great research and doing it well, we want this work. To, we want this work to actually have impact and change. We're trying to get that idea about with our students that as they go out and become working organisations, citizens of society, we want them to be thoughtful and to recognise the impact they can have through their use of language. So, if we can jump over to the next slide. So, what we've done in relation to that, we've put. A number of different tables in there which actually gives some guidelines for non-discriminatory language. Notice there I'm, the one typo I didn't pick up, I thought I'd pick them up, it should be non-discriminatory rather than just no discriminatory, but no discriminatory language would be even better, let's be honest. Um, so racist terms, so using developing nations, for example, rather than using the non-racial or race neutral alternatives such as non-Western or talking about ethnic minorities as a racist term rather than minority ex ethnic. And these things are really crucial. Um, we talk about not using gender specific terms, so businessman rather than business person. We shouldn't be using businessman, obviously. Um, we've also gone through and worked with organisation uh, with groups to ensure we've got the um, pronouns and alternative non-binary forms. So the obvious ones are she and he as uh, binary pronouns and non-binary things like they but we've got we've gone into the more detailed ones so we've got cis etc etc and then how they can be used and then the other one which we really think is important is about disabledist and non-disabledist alternatives so not using terms like spastic or blind but talking about a person who has cerebral palsy or a person who is visually impaired and making sure we emphasize the person in in our writing rather than disablement. So that sort of looks at the um, language times of things. We've also tried to make the book more accessible and so if we can jump to the next slide please. This slide I think illustrates what we've done in terms of the printed book very well. In the um, eighth edition of the printed book we had a worked example which was a focus on management research based on some work a great friend of mine, David Gray and I had done work as a piece of consultancy for a company in London looking at um, small looking at small business success. And in the original version in the eighth edition, we actually reproduced the a graph directly from the report, obviously with um, full permissions to do so. When it came to the, this last edition, with the guidelines that are available on what's easy for people who are partially sighted to see, we, we it was pointed out by Kay quite rightly that that was not particularly easy to interpret. And so on the basis of Kay, Kay Richardson's comments, it was redrawn for the ninth edition to be much more easy to interpret for people who are visually impaired. And so we've um, so immediately we can see we've done that in the paper version. We've gone much more into this in the digital version. So let's look at some of the digital formats now. Yeah, what we've done on the digital formats is we've used the WCAG, which is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, and basically, they said for anything which is copyright 2022 onwards, this is what should be done. So fortunately, the people at Pearson are up on this and they've been able to They've been phenomenal at helping us in able to do this. And so 
what we do on the um digital formats is when we use video, which is a large amount of video in there as extra materials, we make sure the video is close captioned. So you you can actually see there on that side there, you can actually see the captions appearing on there as it plays and that you, it allows auto replay. And the other thing is we we, we can download, um trans, we have transcripts to download as well. You can see the transcript of this video here about recycling bins of a difference. And the whole point of the video is not just for a video to be seen, but then it links into discussion and question in the text to actually learn from this in, in relation to research methods each time. If we could have the next slide, please. We've also used um, screen readers. So this is one from the Revel version, which is the online interactive version of the book. And what we've got here is we, we, we've got the screen picture on the left hand side which is relating to literature views as a, as a funnel and then what we can also do is we can use for people who are partially sighted we can have alternative text which not only describes the funnel but then speaks what's going on in each of the sections within that funnel as it as it narrows down so you actually get a full description of what it would look like to a sighted person for a person who is visually impaired so we, we enable both sides and we can do we do this for both images which are static and interactive. Let's have the next slide. And then building on what we've done in the book in terms of where we talk about names of people, we've also we've included quite a lot of videos and extra illustrations in the online side of things. And we've made sure that we've got diversity and inclusivity within this. So if we look down on the left hand side, we've got Mika, who's just talking about her master's research project there. And as you can see, Mika talks a lot with her hands. She's one of one of my ex students. Absolutely fantastic piece of research as well. And then we and then we've included things like in the top right hand side, in identifying a super a sampling frame. Question two. Thanks. Thanks for the comment, Dewey. Really nice to hear there. What we've done there is we've actually with this um, identifying a super a suitable sampling frame question, we've actually um got the, a person there talking the, talking through the question and so we've linked that into the coastal caption and then finally we've got other illustrations of different people as you can see a colleague writing and then a different name with, with Andres when he's talking about his research and his mixed methods research so we're bringing in different different names males females different ethnicities etc cetera, etc cetera. people are partially cited and so on so thanks for that if we can jump on to the next slide I wanted to finish up with a little bit about some um, teaching of this and in particular it's something which really has struck me over the past few years um, and I, I put a, I credit a lot of this to my son who last week became an Australian citizen which is he's very happy about this but he he had been very instrumental in getting me to read differently about um, the discovery as we would call it in the western colonization of of Australia. And so in the chapter on research philosophy, the opening vignette, which I referred to earlier, talks about some um, assumptions being made by researchers and, and these are colonial settlers, so Western people researching about what is being researched and, and that in effect is First Nations Australians. And the vignette starts to reveal how the assumptions shape the way the research topic is seen, the data collected. And so in the vignette, we talk about surfacing the implication of research as values, but we also talk, finish up with something like that, that bit in italics at the bottom where we say, just as colonialist, colonialist beliefs and assumptions affected how they interpreted what they saw in Australia and other colonised lands, our own belief assumptions and associated taken for granted assumptions can impact on our interpretations in the research we pursue. And so we start from there and then this is how I actually teach it and I teach it with the fact that um, it's very much European assumptions on, on, on culture and these have privileged certain accounts of Australian history and ignored or undervalued the voices of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander First Nation peoples and yet they're the uh, oldest living cultures on earth and how about how decolonization looks to rectify this so 
I started off with um, a YouTube video. I'm not going to play the YouTube video, but we have got the link later. But if we flip onto it, let's just have a look at the next one. This is one that Ben, my son, put me onto, and it's some um, Ziggy Ramono on song called Tell the Other Little Things. But it's basically an original people's Australian telling the story. But what I want to bring out from this, I, I normally play this as they walk into the lecture theatre because it, it tends to get them in the right mood for what we're doing. But what it starts off, what, what is crucial here is about the what happened in 1493 when the Doctrine of Discovery by the Pope Alexander VI basically says that if you come to a land and the people on it aren't human, are only human if they're Christians. So when they got to Australia, those people weren't Christians. They had different beliefs. And the Pope had said, if you, there are no P Christians there, then that land is yours. So you can grab it and that's tough to anybody else. And this doctrine of discovery has been absolutely crucial, was absolutely crucial to the colonisation of Australia and how people just came and took the land. Now, nowadays, when you go to Australia, which... I've been really fortunate to have, I think I worked it out the other night, four visiting prof professorships at Griffith in Brisbane. You see a very different picture. So if we have the next slide. You see signs like this. So at every single lecture in the university, there is an acknowledgement of country where they talk about how Griffith University, where I was working, acknowledged the people who are the traditional custodians of the land, pays respect to the elders past and present and expends respects respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. You see things outside, for example, outside the New South, New South Wales Library. Acknowledges the people of the Aura Nation, the traditional custodians of the land on which this library stands. We celebrate that. So there's a real acknowledgement that something pretty terrible was done. But how does this relate to talk, teach and research methods? If you look on the right hand side of the side, there is this absolutely amazing book by Bruce Pascoe to, called Dark Emu, where he takes the data from the original settlers. Do you remember there was that picture of the book of the old Bush Times? He takes that data and reanalyzes it through a different lens. If we can have the next slide, please. So I start talking about um the vignette and critiquing researchers' beliefs about the natures of reality. What's legitimate data? And how their values affect both the data that's been gathered and how it's been interpreted subsequently. And I get them to say, well, how are your how do your assumptions affect the data account? And then we and we explore through the dominant narrative of colonial settlers and contrast with Australian peoples. And as part of that, I this normally gets students absolutely, I think the best word for it is gobsmacked, to be perfectly honest. I don't think there's a better word to describe it. Where I say until 1967, Aboriginal peoples were excluded from being counted for constitutional purposes. They didn't exist. And that's what the voting cut point that there is about. They were not included in populations of states and territories and they weren't allowed to vote. There is a, there is a lot of rumour going around that says Aboriginal peoples were not were, were considered to be flora and fauna up until the mid 70s. I've checked into that. It's not true. <laughs> and I can see Daniel nodding about that. because He knew the rumour. But if you look at it, that was never there was no data which actually shows that, I th which I think is quite interesting. So I had to rewrite the case study when I found that there was no data from. And that was written in a quite a well, a well referenced um, academic piece. So let's have a look at the dominant narrative. And this is what I'd be doing with my students. The dominant narrative from old times bush in the bush of Australia says Aboriginal peoples are hunters and gatherers. They're heathens and they don't have an existing economy. So. In other words, primitive. And that's I, that I recognise the derogatory nature of that term, but that's part of what comes through from this this pamphlet. European colonists, however, are superior in science, technology and religion, and they're spreading the word of their God. In return for wealth of the colonised land, and that's what the dominant narrative is. Let's have a look at the um, an alternative narrative which comes out of the Dark Emu book. 
And this is using exactly the same data in that Bush's old times again, but interpret it through a different set of lenses for a different epistemology, different ontology, different axiology, different set of values. Aboriginal peoples cultivated and irrigated crops living in villages. They were sophisticated in their food production and land management systems for what was a very, very fragile ecosystem. The European colonists didn't understand how to manage this fragile e ecosystem. They didn't make any treaties and stole the land. And as, if you go back to the Ziggy Ramon song, sovereignty was never, ever ceded. So they never actually were given any of that land. It's very different from what happened in Canada, for example, where sovereignty was ceded to the exact the land. Now, if we just go on to a little bit more of what I which I go into more detail in the class. So the next slide, please. Um, what Pasco does is he looks at one aspect, which is the Murray River system, and he takes these data and he and he and combines a variety of other diaries together and says, hang on, what's really going going on? Because James Kirby looked at it all as a colonist, wrote it down, he said, and he and he talks about how they have these these systems of weirs which channel water into various places, which make deep enough ponds for the fish to live, and then they they just sit there all day fishing and collect it. And that uh, you, we could argue quite happily today is very sophisticated. And what they're actually doing is they're using their knowledge to actually create a place where they can harvest fish easily. And yet Kirby interprets this as being indolence and laziness. So we've got we could interpret exactly the same data differently. And we get into a big discussion about this, even in large lecture theatres. So where does this leave us on um, relating to philosophical assumptions in research? We'd have the penultimate slide. Um, the first thing is. If we look at ontology, the colonists assumed First Nation that Australians were hunter gatherers and lazy viewing what they saw. And yet that's not the case. They considered epistemologically only certain types of knowledge is legitimate. They liked numerical, they liked textual, they liked visuals and facts, but narratives and stories, no. In terms of their values, and they very much felt it was their duty to spread their version of civilization, the word of their God to heathens, and that value, which I think is the terra nullis, nullius, the land is your God given right if there's no Christians in sight. Hopefully you can see how that not only gets it over to our students, the ideas of decolonization, but it also makes ontology, epistemology, and axiology, research philosophy really, really exciting. What well, did to me anyway. Um, I'm going to finish up before opening up for as many questions as guys want to um, just these references. The only ones I put in here are um, relate to the things which for, for teaching them um, the philosophy side. So you've got the the Kirby reference, and I know you, you're going to get copies of the slides, so that's fine. There's no need to note it down, or you can always take a photo, as people do now. You've got that Pasco book, Darkemu, it's available on Amazon. It's about six or seven pounds. It's fantastic value for money. Then you've got Ziggy Ramones things, you can download it or just access it from YouTube in Lecture Theatre. And then obviously there's the bit from the book. I would say, though, that chapter four of the book, if you just want to have a look, is available on academia.edu and on um, ResearchGate, and it's available to download free of charge the most recent copy with the permission of lovely people at Pearson. That's pretty much all I wanted to say. Thank you for staying with me for the time. I managed to keep it pretty much the 45 minutes, which I was asked to talk for. But questions in the chat or do feel free to demute yourself and we'll see where we end up. Happy to answer any. any. Thanks for that, Mark. Well, um, people are gathering their thoughts and um, thinking of some questions, maybe typing away madly in the chat. Um, I'll start with some of our uh, pre-submitted questions. So um, the first one was, uh, how is the research methods for business student textbook accommodating an increasingly diverse audience, including students from the global south and from contexts where research conceptualizations, traditions and practices differ somewhat from the West? So obviously you've probably touched on that a bit, but if there's a anything on you that. wanted to. Yeah. I mean, I think you've seen the um, stuff on in terms of global audience, in terms of ethnicity, gender being 
agenda as well. In terms of the Global South, we've, we've started to bring in more examples from there and involve academics working in those parts of the world in developing case studies and working with us. There is a whole new area of research about de de decolonizing research methods. And what we've done at the moment is we've got a wide variety of methods, some of which may or may not work so well. So, for example, if we take interviewing, interviewing in a traditional Western sense of asking questions and somebody responding tends to work pretty well. In other parts of the world, it doesn't. And it would be much more of an interview in as, as in storytelling. So, for example, I was working out in South Africa just before Easter, working with them. Uh, traditionally backed universities to, to help develop research capabilities. And one of the things which is very clear there that a traditional interview is nowhere near as useful as actually getting people to talk in, in, in stories. So we've incorporated storytelling within the book. We haven't thrown out methods, but we've brought in other methods as well. Is, I think it's the best way to say that as a, a quick overview. Sure, that sounds um, quite interesting. Um, we have a question here from Bridget. Um, if you want to come off mute, Bridget, feel welcome. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, in, in terms of um, as researchers collecting data and not using identifiers such as he or she, yeah. what if the study is about a particular gender? For instance, you're studying women exclusively in the research. Are you also allowed to just assume that they would um, not mind using she or um he she pronouns like is going on now are you, is it okay to just assume or just treat them as because it's ge one gender mm. and use the right pronouns for them i think with this the most crucial thing is to ask is to ask your participants how they wish to be referred to and, th and let them decide i think we have spake we have spent too long as researchers doing research upon people rather than with or for and I, my my desire in the work I do is is increasingly to do research with people and to actually involve them as as partners in the research so I think if we do that then it's very much how do they wish to be referred thank you that's right Bridget nice to nice to meet you ah Alban as I think has got one in the Oh, thank you for the reference. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to write that down. Don't, I'm, must, we must save the chat. Yeah, that's thank right. You. It should save. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Elbina. Um, I guess moving on to some more general questions about the subject. Um, yeah. What do you feel are the biggest opportunities around research methods as a subject? I'm just I'm just going to stop for a second. I've got a giant wasp buzzing around my office. I'm going to let it out and I will answer the question there. You see, we have a reality here. Sorry, right. uh, we were doing a webinar yesterday and we had a fire alarm, so these things happen. All right, wasp has gone. And so, oh, in fact, it was a hornet, so I'm feeling a lot less a lot less uncalm. And it was about the, the future of research methods. I think we're going to see an increasing amount of digital and online. I think the pandemic hastened that, but I also think we don't understand that that well yet. Um, a similar one with that I would argue with is with chat GTP. I think chat GTP at the moment looks frightening, frightening and exciting at the same time. I've been doing quite a lot of work on chat GTP. Our students will be using it, so we need to understand how it works. And we also will need to to, to, to enable our students to use it productively rather than to use it um, with, with a non-critical mindset. Because for me, it seems the most crucial thing that chat GTP lacks is, is the criticality of a human of a human mind. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think uh, for, for it, if anyone wants to go any more into the chat GPT angle, we do have, um, Pearson has run some webinars recently about that and I think we've got more on the horizon so mm -hmm. um, we delve into that issue more as a whole but yeah interesting to hear about that from a research methods perspective mm -hmm. um, what else do we have so um, what about the the biggest challenges you see in research methods I think the big the 
it, dep- it the challenges depend are different in in different parts of the world. There's no doubt. I think I think the biggest challenge is is de-westernizing it and becoming much more global in terms of looking at alternative methods because there is a very very narrow set of Western methods. Within that, I think another challenge we're facing is the increasing quantification of things which cannot be quantified. And I can see about probably 50% of the audience being happy with that and the other 50% not being quite so happy. But it, it's really, I think that's, it, it, it's crucial. There's just certain things which we cannot answer in quantitatively. And yet there is a, a very strong drive to actually con- increasingly look for quantitative patterns. And the other challenge is to enable our students to, in- to learn to interpret objectively and recognise when they be- recognise their biases when they can't be objective because nobody can be completely objective. Yeah, and that very much talks to what we've what you've covered today. So that's very important. Um, I guess where do you see learning gaps in in research methods for students coming in? Again, I'm speaking from only part part of a UK, Australian, a South African areas I've done most work. Thing. I think there is a, a quantitative learning gap in that student, not only the quantitative learning gap in being able to press the buttons in the right order, but the ability to look at something and say that doesn't seem right. So to look at, say, for, to look at statistics and see a correlation of seven and say, well, there's something wrong there. And I think that so that that's a learning gap in qualitative. I think there's also a learning gap in, in enabling students to be able to write critically and it's something which only comes with practice and the the trouble with that is we only become able to understand things when we can when we write them and it and it's painful and what we've seen over the past 20 years is students are much better at writing shorter rather than longer things they're better at verbal rather than at or talking rather than writing and we've and we've seen a lot of, especially with chapter P, we're seeing a lot of things coming in now which will enable them to write, or it, or get them some writs of stuff written, but it won't in- enable the criticality. And at the end, of the day, anything they submit which they say they've written has to be marked as if it's theirs. And if they haven't, we're going to start to get loads of problems. Yeah, yeah, at all. Sounds sounds good. Um, do you? Um, Sorry, I'm just going through what we have. Uh, just trying to what we've covered. So, um, do you have any tips on how to ensure students are attractive to prospective employers? And is that a is that a big concern in research methods as a subject? I think re- I think research methods should is should be the ultimate thing in enabling students to make themselves attractive. It starts with the choice of the topic they do their research project dissertation thesis on. In the, if that, that if that links to where they're looking for it, the area they were looking for a job, that tends to be pretty helpful. Yeah. Um, I then think the next thing is it, its ability to be able to talk cogently about something and to present it from a position of knowledge which again research methods does but the cr- most crucial thing that research methods does it, it it actually teaches them to be able to find out and to find out within a critical mindset rather than to accept things that they're told it teaches them to question with reason rather than just question or question with justification yeah it's a really good point um and then i guess another one is what are your tips to increase student engagement in research methods so obviously once again you've covered a bit of this already but yeah. um, if there's anything else random you might be able to add to that um i i we've written quite a lot on this um i think it, it's about involving them in the process and making it relevant to them and also sometimes there are certain things i mean Research ethics can be taught in a real, for example, can be taught in a really exciting way. And I could have easily used that as an example of looking at EDI issues, because if you look at the Pilgrim experiments and what was done to human beings just because they happen to be black, I mean, giving black people syphilis to see what happens. And that was allowed. This is why we need ethics committees. I, I can't think of a, I can think of other justifications, but I can't think of one which is more shocking. 
and yet more poignant as to why it's crucial. And I think it's so it's bringing. I think it's also about making it relevant to them and their lives and keeping it completely up to date. So, for example, when you're looking at um, sampling, sample size, if you look on a te TV advert in the UK, say for some face cream or something like that, if the advert at the bottom of it says based on a sample of, it basically means the sample wasn't large enough to be statistically significant. <laughs> and so, but students know that 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 brings it to life. It's real. Uh, the other thing is to actually get them to do it. If if the university doesn't like them collecting data from other people, certainly in all the universities I've worked at, they can collect data from somebody else in the class without having to go through ethical approval if it's for educational reasons. But actually getting them to do a telephone interview with a friend, have, to have two rooms and get them ringing up people in other rooms, get them to actually try and negotiate access and do it, is, it brings it to life for them. Yeah, I can imagine that's that's a really impactful, yeah. impactful way to teach. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat, so I think we will close there. So um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining and participating. And also a special thanks to um, Babby and Dan from Pearson for all your hard work in the background. Um, yeah, of course, definitely. big thanks to Mark and Mark for joining and sharing your knowledge today. It's been very much appreciated. Um, we'll be in touch with everyone um, after this in the form of two emails. One, giving you information on how you can get in touch with someone from Pearson for things like a sample copy of the book, uh, a demonstration of Pearson courseware like Revel, which Mark has covered today, um, or a consultation if you'd just like to speak uh, to someone from Pearson to hear a bit more. Uh, then there'll be a second email a bit later with a link to the recording of today's webinar. And that's it. So thanks Just again. Just one other thing, Dan, oh, sure. um, yeah. which is, I say this often to people, and if you're doing something and you and you think, my gosh, the book doesn't cover this, that and this is really important, please email me. The, books, the book has grown and altered and got better because of you guys. So please do keep, keep those things coming. And if there's something you're thinking, how the heck do I do that? I may not know how to do it myself, but I probably know somebody who does. So if you're getting stuck, do please get in touch and don't sit there on your own. It's a fantastic topic, to, subject to teach. I'm still learning, which is even better still. So and thank you for coming. Great. Thanks, everyone. Well, yeah, we'll finish up there. But um, as Mark says, get in touch. And yeah, thanks for your participation today. And bye for now. Bye.